So if you remember earlier in the course, I took you to that one place, that most special place in the whole world for me, uh, particularly as it relates to me falling in love with astronomy, and that was Lake Michigan. Well, in this video, I want to take you to another place, another very special place to me, and that is here at Calvin College. So this is where I went to school for my undergrad. It's in Grand Rapids. And in particular, I want to take you up there. That is the Kelvin Observatory. And we're going to make our way up to the telescopes up there to learn a little bit about uh, exactly what telescopes look like, what they're capable of, and how they work. So let's go take a look. Before we go up to the observatory, though, we need to make a quick stop in the physics lab. So here I've got a whole bunch of lenses. And the important thing to know about a telescope is that at its core, all it really is is two lenses. So let's take a peek. So let's say I take these two lenses right here. Now these lenses have different focal lengths, right? Like they, they have a different curvature to them. But when I stack them together, I can get a magnified view of whatever it is I'm looking at. So let's say I try to look at that clock up on the wall up there, right? If I take one lens and put it close to my eye, and then take a second lens and try to get them in focus by moving them toward and away from each other. It's kind of tricky. Oh, there it was. There, there. Oh, you see that view of the tele... There, you see there's the... There's the clock. And it's zoomed in. You see there's the clock? And it's not quite in focus. Oh, I'm close. But getting them lined up perfectly is really hard, right? So the innovation of Galileo and the early telescope makers was to mount these two lenses just the right distance from each other and in a tube. That's really all it is. A telescope is just an empty tube with two lenses in it that are aligned to each other. Now, later refinements of the telescope allow you to carefully adjust the distance between those two lenses so that you can focus at different distances, but as far as we're concerned for looking at space, everything is so far away that we can just kind of choose a focus of outer space <laughs> and everything will be in focus. Now that's not where telescopes ended though, right? Like, like they didn't just end with these little kinds of lenses. They got more and more sophisticated, which we'll see shortly. Now at its heart, what a lens does is it takes light and it focuses it down. So if I have light coming from outer space, what a lens does is it focuses that light down to a spot we call a focus, all right? What a telescope does though, is by putting two lenses together and lining up where their focuses are, okay, it'll take um, that light from a really big lens and it will focus it down to a much more compact area. And that does two things for us. One is it sort of, I would say, it collects more light in a smaller space. More light in smaller space. That's really the most important thing that a telescope does for us, okay? The other thing it does is you could say it sort of quote unquote zooms in, right? Makes things look bigger. But by far, this is the most important thing that a telescope does for us. It takes all the light over a really big area, right, because everything in space is really, really faint, and it shrinks it down to a much smaller area, concentrates that light so that we can see deeper and further objects. And you might say, like, why isn't this as important? Because you can zoom in as much as you want. By changing this lens, called the eyepiece, you can zoom in as much as you want, even with a really small telescope. But zooming in doesn't help you if there's not enough light there to see. So unless this part of the telescope, the front, the primary of the telescope is really big, zooming in doesn't do you any good. Now, Galileo was working with telescopes like this. We call them refracting telescopes because they use the refraction of light through the lens, light bending through the lens. But Newton and others helped us immensely with the creation of reflecting telescopes. And these telescopes, instead of using a primary lens, they used a curved mirror. Now a curved mirror can do the same thing that a lens can do. 
The difference is that you can make them much, much larger. It's way easier to make a giant mirror than it is to make a giant lens. But see how they do the same thing, watch this. If I have light coming in to a big curved mirror, that curved mirror, like even like, the, like it's shaped like the bottom of a spoon, right? It will reflect light down to a focus in just the same way that the lens did, all right? But then you're like, well, how do I put another lens there? Like, what, my, isn't my head going to block the light? It gets all messed up. And that's where there's all kinds of creative ways to make telescopes, reflecting telescopes. Newton created a kind that looked like this. All right, there's like a tube. You've got a curved mirror on the back, and then there's a little flat mirror right here. So as that light is coming into focus, it actually gets bounced out of the telescope tube, and you put your little eyepiece right here. That's called a Newtonian. But there are many other kinds of telescopes. We call it Newtonian, of course, because Isaac Newton invented that. And one of my favorites is a Cassegrain telescope. Cassegrains, okay, have it bounce off of that mirror in the back. The light comes in, bounces off the mirror in the back, and then there's another mirror, another kind of curved mirror right here, and that light bounces right through a little hole in the middle of the telescope. Now this is probably seeming confusing and abstract, which is why we're going to keep going up to the observatory, just one floor above us right now. So here we are at the observatory, and take a look. This is like a legit real-life observatory, and what you see is the main telescope up here, and down here you have this crazy cage, which is super cool. Um, and what I want to do is I want to start by just showing you a small telescope. All right, so this is an 8-inch telescope in here, and this is an example of one of these Cassegrain telescopes. All right, I'm going to take this outside to the observing deck just a second here. All right, there's the telescope. And now you can see here, if I lift it up, oh, this telescope, you can actually see the curved mirror that's inside of it. If I tip it up and take off the cap, you can look inside, and there, as big as this whole diameter, you can see a mirror. See it in there? Hello? Hello? And you can maybe tell it's curved because my reflection is super warped and kind of weird, right? And right in the middle of that mirror, is a hole cut into it, and that hole is what comes out the bottom here. All right, now this telescope can get mounted ugh, right onto one of these mounts right here. Ugh. Right, and the thing I want to highlight about this mount a couple things. First of all, I want to highlight that this entire mount is tilted, and you notice it's tilted at about 45 degrees. And it's tilted there because this mount is not connected to the horizon coordinate system, but instead it's aligned to the celestial equatorial coordinate system. So this disk here, if you extended it out into space, would point right to the celestial equator, which means that the top of the telescope through this hole right here would point directly at the north celestial pole or Polaris. Now the reason we do that, right, is to help us find objects in space, right? We learned earlier that the horizon coordinate system doesn't do us all that much good because everything's always moving. And so instead, we use the celestial equatorial system. And you can even see there's marks right here on the telescope that can spin around. And you notice, this is so cool. I don't know if you notice this, it says zero, one, two, three, four, and it counts all the way up to 23 and 24, right? So this is right ascension, right ascension right here. And on the side, there's similar angles that are marked all the way around representing declination. So this telescope, if you know where an object is in the next night sky, it's right ascension and declination, you can use the fact that this mount is tilted um, along with, right, these what are called setting circles, to find an object in the sky. Now, when I first learned how to use a telescope, that's what we had to do. We had to set the setting circle, move the telescope just the right amount to get the precise angle to find an object in the sky. And then to get the object in focus, you would turn this little knob 
which gently moves the mirrors one from the other. Now, today, that's like an outdated way to do it. In fact, you can see the cobwebs on this telescope. That's just not what we do anymore. Instead, all our telescopes are computer controlled. All right, so let's go check out the big telescope. All right, sweet. There it is, and there's Michaela. Hi, Hi. Michaela. Good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> Michaela's an astronomy student. You're a senior, right? Uh, junior. Junior, awesome. Now, what can you tell me about this telescope? Like, how big is it? You know, what kind of telescope is it? Yeah, so this is the Schmidt Cassegrain telescope, which means it's got the, um, it's got the primary and secondary, and then the hole in there. Right, okay, cool. So I can actually see the mirror down there, yeah. and I can see that there's a hole in it. I can just barely see that. Mm -hmm. And then there's a secondary mirror up here, which is bouncing that light back down. So this yeah. is the same sort of mirror telescope that we have out on the deck. Yes. Yeah. And now, so if I come around to this side of the telescope, we see where that hole leads, right? Mm -hmm. And there's actually an opening in the back here where there's all kinds of stuff yeah. mounted. Yeah. We have the, so the eyepiece, eye right? Yeah. Now I should point out, because we saw outside that the mount mm -hmm. of the smaller telescope was angled. Mm -hmm. And this mount is angled the same way, right? So this is actually lined up with the celestial equator. Yep. And this axis of the whole telescope is pointed right at the north celestial pole. So in the same way that the outdoor telescope was aligned to the Earth's rotation, this telescope yes. is as well. Yes, the one plus though is that the computer does all the exactly, time. Exactly, exactly. Of, of the person, which is so great. Well, can we, can we see the telescope, sure. like, or maybe the dome opening up, or yeah, how would you do it? I'll just do the little startup sequence. Sure. Sweet. That's pretty awesome. Sweet, okay, so we got the dome open, mm -hmm. we've got the telescope linked to it, and so now are we ready to move the telescope and point it at something? Yeah, so we could move the telescope. Uh, basically, go to the home position, yeah. which is just straight up. Once it's done slewing, I'm gonna um, turn it Okay, so now it's pointing at the moon. And I'm going to connect the telescope to Poth. Right. And now Poth knows where the telescope is, and now I can say slave dome, and the whole dome should be. Right. So now here comes the dome. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. And now the telescope is pointed at the moon, which yeah. is mostly behind the clouds and very close to the sun, so yeah. not much to see. Yeah. Um, that is awesome. And so these two, like, or these three different finder scopes on here are really um, refracting telescopes, right? So they have lenses in them, in the front and the back, and just contrasting that to the mirror that we use in the large primary. Now just for fun, could you like, um, turn off the white lights and turn on the red lights. Yeah. It's like an observatory yeah. thing is that we yeah. go to like night mode. And then turn on all the red ones. And nice. Turn off the white lights. You get like the atmosphere, super mm -hmm. cool. So one of the benefits about having a computer controlled telescope is that it really actually can be anywhere in the world. You don't even need to be there to look through it, right? Because the computer knows exactly where it's pointed. So um, Kelvin has an identical telescope, right? This is the one we just saw up in the observatory. They have an identical one in the dark sky sites of uh, New Mexico. And I had a chance to be there and help build it when I was a student. And so the students here, when they're doing uh, serious observing, will actually go into this control room, their New Mexico observatory control room. And this is really exactly like what professional astronomers do. They don't often go in to the observatory and look through it, especially at the, the biggest and best observatories in the world. Instead, they're sitting in control rooms just like this controlling telescopes and looking at the images that are captured by the digital camera. So let's check in with Michaela and just see what this control room, what this control room looks like. And you can turn the Right, the, all on. the controls are the same. So just yeah. like we had a computer upstairs, it's an identical computer, identical telescope, everything's exactly the mm -hmm. same. And you wow. turn on the dome light, 
So you've got a little lamp in there. Right. Uh, a plan. Right. Which looks something like. Yes, I remember this. So you don't have to stay up all night telling it where to go, take a picture, go here, take a picture. Instead, you just have this really simple file mm -hmm. which tells it over the course of the night, go here, take these pictures, go here, take these pictures. And so really the astronomers can just go to bed, yeah. right, and, and wake up and look at all their pictures. Mm -hmm. And because it's computer controlled, it even starts and finishes all by itself. Yeah, exactly. That's super cool. Yeah. That's my kind of observing. Right instead of staying up all night. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Michaela. You're welcome, for sure. Thanks for coming. Yeah, appreciate it.